Okay, and everybody's getting to know about it. Wonderful. So at this point, we're going to look at uh, Psalm, a part of Psalm 116, and I'll ask uh, Jim uh, to unmute yourself and please take us through this. I will take the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will take the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. How shall I make a return to the Lord for all the good that he has done for me? The cup of salvation I will take up and I will call upon the name of the Lord. I will, I will take the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. Precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. I am your servant, the son of your handmaid. You have loosed my bonds. I will, take I will take the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. To you I will offer sacrifice of thanksgiving, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. My vows to the Lord I will pay in the presence of all of his people. I will take the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. Okay, so as we were listening to, to Jim proclaim this, what uh, words and phrases and images uh, struck us? Be sure to unmute yourself if you're going to share. I call on the name of the Lord. I am your servant. Call on the name of the Lord. I am your servant. Okay, I'll, I'll take, a, take us through some reflections. What can I return to the Lord? All his goodness to me. Uh, this is my own literal translation of the psalm. Uh, a lot of people smooth that out in, in English, but that literally, that's what it says. What can I return to the Lord? All his goodness to me. <clears throat> I'm convinced that religion is at least 90% about what God does for us, and at most 10% about what we do for God. Most, most preachers get that reversed and focus on what we should do. When I'm teaching preaching, I tell them, the students, it's not good to should on people. <clears throat> uh, and uh, once uh, Bishop Friend gave me a, uh, uh, a document from the American bishops, a uh, draft document to make comments on. I'm sure he gave it to some other peoples to get feedback. And after I had read about three pages and circled every time the word should appeared, I wrote at the bottom of the third page, tell your brother bishops not to shut on the faithful. <clears throat> uh, a cup of salvation I will lift up. On the name of the Lord I will call. It's not clear exactly what is meant by cup of salvation. Perhaps it was something that the worshiper would drink. Or the other possibility is that it's a, a libation, an ancient custom of pouring out, pouring out uh, an offering to the God, uh, to God, or if you're pagan, to the gods. And uh, one of my favorite action films is uh, a guy flick, uh, Troy, with Brad Pitt. And in one of the early say, scenes, the two kings, or the king <clears throat> and uh, the prince of Troy are at a banquet, and they're about to drink, and they say, to the gods, and both of them pour their cup uh, onto the ground, and, and then they, they drink. So uh, the cup of salvation might be like that. We just don't know. Precious in the eyes of the Lord the death of his faithful ones. Uh, perhaps the psalmist has been sick 
or perhaps in danger from his enemies. All mortals must die, but the Lord is reluctant to allow his faithful people to die young. Uh, that is, that's what precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. <clears throat> he, he, does, he knows they have to die, but he doesn't want them to die too soon. And the psalmist here is implicitly claiming to be one of the Lord's faithful ones. Uh, I'm, that's why I'm still around, uh, because he, he doesn't want us to die too soon. Verse 16, Ah, Lord, ah, indeed, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your handmaid. <clears throat> the psalmist claims a humble status using family analogies. It's a polygamous society. The psalmist is not claiming to be the son of one of the first-class wives. Think of the matriarchs Rachel and Leah, who were mothers of some of the sons of Israel. Nor does he claim to be the wife of a concubine, one of the second-class wives. Think, uh, think of Bilhah and Zilpah, the, the second-class wives of uh, <clears throat> Israel, who bore the rest of the 12 tribes. <clears throat> and uh, I'm fond of saying concubines are not sluts in a polygamous society. They're, they're second-class wives. And if you live in a monogamous society <clears throat> that's been monogamous for centuries, you don't develop words for first-class wives and second-class wives. But if you, if you do live in such a society, you get words for those, and then they sound very strange to people who are used to monogamous society. Uh, you have loosed up, uh, rather, he claims to be the son of one of the master's servant girls, uh, the son of your handmaid. So he has a very low status in the household. He doesn't really have any claim on the master, but the master has been generous. You have loosed my bonds. Perhaps he has been granted freedom. Sometimes the master would do that. Or perhaps the master has helped him out of a tight spot, helped him out of a jam. Who knows? But it's, it's like being untied. You have loosed my bonds. To you, I will offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving, and some render it, I will offer a sacrifice of praise. The Hebrew can be translated either way. And I will call upon the name of the Lord. So God has granted some favor to the psalmist, and offering the sacrifice is the psalmist's way of saying thanks. The Hebrew word todah can mean thanks. As a matter of fact, in modern Israel, if someone does you a, a favor or gives you a present, you say, Toda, thanks. <clears throat> uh, so one thanks God by praising God. They're, they're synonymous in worship. Uh, and when we get to the gospel, we'll see that some of the gospel writers say that Jesus gave thanks, and others will say that he, uh, he said a blessing. Uh, to, to bless God is another synonym for, for praising God. Uh, uh, later tradition will interpret sacrifice of praise differently. During the exile, animal sacrifices were impossible. After worship, originally worship, you could worship anywhere, but then during the time of David and Solomon, it got centralized in uh, Jerusalem, and only the Levitical priests, the sons of Aaron, were allowed to offer sacrifice. And one of my liturgy professors at Notre Dame one summer said, at that time, some fool picked a fight with the Babylonians, and pretty soon the only people who could offer sacrifice were now in a place where they couldn't do it. So what happens is during the exile, sacrifice of praise gets a new a new meaning. It's the same phrase, but it means living a life uh, 
that praises God. That no, we can't burn up animals while we're here, but we can still praise God. We can offer a sacrifice of praise, living a life that praises our Lord. It is in this sense that the phrase eventually entered the, the Roman canon, Eucharistic Prayer 1, in the commemoration of the living. Remember, Lord, your servants. And then you can pause there uh, to put in the names of anyone that you want to. Uh, this is one of my favorite places. I, I always stop and mention silently to God uh, typo there. And all gathered here. Remember, Lord, your servants and all gathered here whose faith and devotion are known to you. For them, we offer you this sacrifice of praise. Or they offer it for themselves and all who are dear to them. For why? For the redemption of their souls in hope of health and well-being and paying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true. And you see, uh, I'm, I'll probably end the, the uh, right there. There's a period in the Missal, but the Latin sentence continues into the next prayer. The eternal God, living and true, in union with those whose memory we celebrate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mother of our Lord and God, Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, and your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon, and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogonus, John, and Paul, Cosmos, and Damien, and all your saints, that through their merits and prayers we may be defended by your protecting help. That's the full, that's all one sentence in Latin. Uh, and and I love it because a lot of my favorite saints are in there from when I was a little boy. <clears throat> my vows to the Lord I will fulfill in the presence of all his people. The psalmist has made a vow. By the way, I forgot to mention this. Uh, if you look uh, at the verses, verse 14 is left out, but it's the same as verse 18, word for word. My vows to the Lord I will fulfill in the presence of all his people. Maybe the, those who compiled the lectionary thought we just need to say this once. But the psalmist has made a vow, and the vow was if the Lord granted it, the psalmist would offer a sacrifice. So, so uh, whatever the vow was, the Lord has done it. And now the sacrifice is a public act. It's not a private thank you. It's done in the presence of all of the people of the Lord. And for many poor people present, this sacrifice might be a rare opportunity for them to eat meat uh, in the temple. When I was over in, in Jordan, they explained to me a lot of the poor people use meat like we use salt and pepper. They use it a little bit of it as a spice every now and then. Uh, and... Uh, uh, so the, this public act, this is a reminder that all the people, the entire people of God are participating in this thanksgiving. Uh, and this is appropriate for the feast of Corpus Christi, the feast of the body of Christ. Paul warns the Corinthians that if they eat and drink without recognizing the body, they eat and drink condemnation. Now, a lot of people think he means that if you eat and drink without recognizing that Christ is present under the form of bread and wine, you're being condemned. That wasn't the problem at all. Everybody knew that Christ was present there under the appearance of bread and wine. The problem was that the rich people got there early and they were having their supper first and the poor people, Sunday was a work day in those days, the poor people who had to work, they didn't get there till later when all the good food was gone and the rich people had had their party. And uh, so Paul says, you're, if you're eating and drinking, if you're having your party and everybody's not here, you're eating and drinking without 
acknowledging the poorest, the weakest, the, the most fragile members of the body of Christ. So this is a good warning uh, for us on the feast of Corpus Christi, the, the, the mystery of the body and blood of Christ, that we worship God under the form of, uh, worship Christ under the form of, of bread and wine, but also we recognize his, his presence in the least of our brothers and sisters uh, as well. And uh, St. John Chrysostom says, uh, I'll, I'll close with this, <clears throat> uh, what if there was a, a coal, a man who was poor and cold and hungry, and you told him, we have built a beautiful building in your honor, and we've adorned it with wonderful pictures and gold vessels, and we celebrate there and sing hymns in your honor. And then you walked away, and you left him cold and hungry. Wouldn't, wouldn't he think, wouldn't he think that you were making fun of him? Would he be honored by, by the songs and the gold vessels uh, and the meal that you were having in his honor? No. Uh, and so St. John Chrysostom says, so yes, we honor the sacramental body of Christ with gold vessels and uh, surrounding it with lovely images, but that's all in vain if we don't recognize the body of Christ in all of his members. So I'll end my question there, or my there, and let me go ahead and proclaim another translate. Oh, wait, I, I gave you my own literal translation of the psalm. We don't need to read another version of it. Uh, and uh, so what are any questions, comments, or observations at this point? We're, we're on a roll today. Uh, uh, we, we might, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and do, uh, do one more. Let me stop the, uh, before we break. Let's go ahead and stop the recording.